Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior training and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. We would also appreciate it if you would make a tax-deductible donation to support our mission of providing stress-free dog education resources. You can find a donation button located at the top of our channel page and at the top of the Your Dog's Friend webpage. A link to our webpage along with the speaker's contact info are listed in the description for this video. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on canine health and witness and, witness and wellness. Um, whether your dog is a puppy, an adult, or a senior, you'll learn a lot that will help you today. But first, let me introduce you to our speaker, Debbie Gross Taraka. We are particularly excited to have Debbie as our speaker. She is a noted author and speaker on canine fitness and rehabilitation as well as co-founder of University of Tennessee's certificate program in canine physical rehabilitation. Debbie is a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist and the owner and practitioner at Wizard of Paws Physical Rehabilitation and Wellness Center for Animals in Colchester, Connecticut. I know that you'll learn a lot from today's webinar and I'm turning it over to you, Deb. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me to do this. And I will, um, and thank you all for being here. We were just discussing, it is a beautiful day. I am uh, coming to you from Mystic, Connecticut. So um, it's a beautiful fall day and it's, it's nice to see. So, um, and as I was out walking my own dogs this morning, I was thinking about this webinar and thinking about canine fitness and getting their activity in. And by the way, if you hear snoring, I have two clumber spaniels and one is snoring away. So he's obviously bored with my, my speaking. He listens to this all the time. But um, as I was going through and just looking at some of these slides earlier, I realized there's so much information that is in this webinar. So there are many things on canine fitness that I'm going to touch upon. You know, certainly if you're interested in learning more, there's plenty of avenues and I have all my contact information at the end and glad to, to help and all of that sort of stuff. But um, so certainly, you know, as I mentioned, looking at canine fitness and, um, uh, we're going to talk about health and wellness from puppies through seniors. And I definitely believe that no matter what, every dog deserves to live the best quality of life for the longest time possible. And um, as mentioned, so I own Wizard of Paws in Connecticut, and we are a busy rehab and wellness clinic. And we see dogs as young as eight weeks of age. And two weeks ago, I evaluated an 18 year old dog. So, um, and with physical rehab, which I'll talk a little bit about the multimodal approach and all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, we look at all of these types of dogs and they range from your active uh, police and working dogs. I work with most of the police dogs in um, our state of Connecticut, our confirmation dogs, agility dogs, fly ball, search and rescue, hunting dogs, active pets. You know, I mentioned my two clumber spaniels. They're my best buddies. My um, almost two-year-old is my hiking buddy as um, um, getting back you know, as most of us, like, you know, pandemic life and uh, all of that sort of stuff. But no matter what, even if that quality of life is for two months, 
we want the dogs to live a great quality of life. And certainly that involves physical fitness, enrichment, mental health, nutrition, all of that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, to me, I, when I see an 18 year old dog, that is such a measure of success. And it's just fantastic to have some of these super seniors out there. And, and he is snoring away. So exercise is beneficial to all dogs. This is one of our senior dogs, and but definitely on different levels. So all of you that are listening today, I am sure our definitions of exercise are different. You know, we have to factor in our age, our baseline, our body type, our weight, our nutrition, our atmosphere, or the area that we live in to factor in our exercise. For me, I love to go for walks. And so often people will say, what's the best activity I could do with my dog? Walk your dog. As crazy as that sounds, I always, um, I believe that dogs that live in a city are better exercised than dogs that live in the country. And a lot of that has to do because city dogs have to go for walks. You know, when I am doing an intake form on a new client and they tell me that they're, they have a big backyard and the dogs can run and play and do all of that, I never count that as exercise. As I said, my dogs, we have a small yard. They go out, one chases squirrels, the other one does his business and comes right back and lays on the patio. So backyard exercise, I don't count. Um, So we factor in all of these things. And for a senior dog, a couple minutes of exercise may be all they can handle. And that may be spread out throughout the day. Whereas some of our more active dogs, like our Malinois, um, may need much more activity. And they're going to need that enrichment as well as physical activity and combine all of that. So one of the biggest mistakes I see with exercising in dogs is overdoing it and trying to mimic things that you see on videos, all that sort of stuff. So not being safe. And I'll discuss that as well. So some of the benefits of exercise, and I am sure, you know, all of us have experienced this. Um, We're going to get increased strength, increased endurance, improved health, increase in the ability to burn calories. So many dogs, as well as people gained weight during the pandemic. And just doing simple um, postural exercises, balance exercises can increase the muscle mass. More increase in muscle mass, the dogs are going to burn more calories. And this is going to help facilitate weight loss. It's going to improve their quality of life. There is nothing I love hearing more than an owner say, oh, you know, my 12-year-old dog got up and greeted me at the door for the first time in six months. You know, just getting the dog feeling better, getting them moving, and now they're able to get up and engage in family activities. Exercise is going to extend a dog's life. So plain and simple, if a dog, the longer they stay moving, the longer they're going to live. You know, this is a, a, many owners are not going to carry their dogs around. I do have some that do that, but mobility is really key, you know, to a dog's livelihood. And of course, improvement in mood and overall activity. And again, think about yourself with, you know, just getting out there and, getting, you know, move, you know, moving with, um, in New England, we've had a hot summer. So, you know, a lot of people weren't able to do a lot of activities, same with their dogs. So getting out there and moving with the cooler weather is starting to feel fantastic. And just it definitely, when you go for either a cup of coffee or a walk, choose the walk because you'll definitely have more benefits including increased blood flow, starting to wake up, all of that sort of stuff. And canine fitness comes in many, many forms. So we'll talk a lot about core strength. And core strength is something that I believe every dog needs to work on, just like people. So all of us, as you're sitting, listening to me, 
you know, you may straighten yourself up. You may, um, you know, need to work on your abdominals, your lower back, all of that sort of stuff. So fix your posture and I'll remind you a couple more times while I'm talking. Endurance activities and endurance can be walking. It could be jogging. It could be trotting, could be hiking, could be walking on a land treadmill, could be walking in an underwater treadmill and it could be swimming. So lots of types of endurance. We can also set up different types of um, cross training stations. And during the pandemic, especially in the dead of winter, I was helping a lot of people set up plans for their dogs indoors because they couldn't do a lot outdoors that just involve cross training stations. So one station, we had the dog work on sit to stands for a minute and then move over to walking backwards for a minute and then working on downs and then working on four limbs up. So there's lots of different variations you can work with. Activity specific. So we'll talk at the end about some sports specific activities. So of course, if the dog is training for a specific activity, we want to help with strengthening that. And then I mentioned quality of life. So just working on walking and keeping the dog active mobility issues. Can we keep the dog strong enough to keep going up and down stairs or in and out of the backyard or in and out of the car? And I know this is a horse, um, but it reminds me to remind you. So when we talk about exercise, we have various principles of exercise and I'm not going to get into all of them, but, um, my daughter is uh, a big time uh, rider and she's been riding for probably about 12 or 13 years. And this is our horse. And one of the things that when I start to get involved in the horse world and comparing it to the dog world or dog world of sports, a horse will jump maybe for a weekend, compete Saturday, Sunday, and then they have a complete day of rest on Monday. So they're taken care of, they're rested, and then they have a very light week. And I think this is something we sometimes miss in canine sports. So a dog may have a four-day agility trial or a three-day agility trial, get home on Sunday night, and Monday they're back at agility class. And factoring in that rest is so important. I mean, rest is crucial for the body, whether we're exercising, competing, com doing a specific sport. Without rest, the body is never going to get stronger or get or improve. And there's the high chance of mental and physical burnout. So every client I work with every day, I tell um the owners of the dog. So we did our activity here. Now the dog's job is to go home and rest so their muscles can grow and they can take some time off for the next 24 hours. And of course, it's going to be specific to the activity. I mean, a horse is much different than a dog, but it's still very important to understand that we need to take, um, you know, take some breaks. And then if we look at the other principles, so specificity, if your dog is involved in a lot of endurance activities, so if they're out herding, if they're um, out in the woods hunting or in field work, we're going to have to factor in a lot of endurance work. The overload principle. So if I picked up a five pound weight and did two sets of 10 bicep curls every single day, that's fantastic. But if I don't push either the number of reps I do or the amount of weight, I'm never going to progress. So there's always that level of overload. Can we increase the activity a little bit more? Variation. So I get bored when I go out on my walk, if I walk the same path, and the same thing with our dogs, we want to vary the exercises. This is going to help with not only what their, um, their overall 
strength and wellness, but it's going to help with boredom and it's going to help with stagnation. Reversibility, very important. So I, um, I'm sure many of you have had a cold for three, four days and you've kind of been down and resting and you get up and you feel you're a little bit off. Well, certainly if where if a dog stops exercising or if we stop exercising, we're going to slide backwards. So we're not going to maintain that level of strength. And very often I hear from my owners is, oh, my dog was doing so great. There was no problems. And I slacked off on the exercises. And now we're starting to have issues again. And it's definitely tough to keep up a regular schedule with things. It's tough for us to do it with ourselves. So here, keeping up the regular exercise pattern. Typically, when we're starting an exercise program, it takes about 10 to 14 days to make a difference. So you can do it every day or every other day, just depending upon the um, intensity. And then certainly three, four times a week, you don't have to you know, do something every single day. Um, I'm a big proponent of trying to fit it into your lifestyle. So for example, my 11 year old clumber has hip dysplasia. He has weakness in his hind end. So while I'm making their, their meals, we do some exercises. So most of us feed our dogs twice a day. You can have them do some simple weight shifting exercises, which we'll get to. Warm up and cool down. So I um, think this is a very important component, both the warm up and the, the cool down. Both are going to prevent injury and prepare the body for exercise and recovery. So when we look at a warm up, one of the worst things that you can do with your dog is if you are competing with them or you're, you're going out for a hike or anything like that is take them from the crate or from the car and just blast them right into activity. So dogs will tend to sleep in a curled up position. So everything is very tight. We let them out of the crate or get them up and they're going to explode and go you know, do their, their activities. Um, not a great prep for your, for your dog. So ideally you should take the, the dog out and I like to factor 10, 15 minutes. And this goes for, if you're in any type of class with your dog, and, you know, if your dog, if your agility class starts at 8 PM, pretend it starts at 7:45, and spend five minutes going out and doing a bathroom or potty break, um, just starting to get the blood flow. And then five minutes of a fast walk or a trot. And then we want to mimic the activities the dog is about to do. So maybe figure eight between your legs, some to sit to stand, some practice jumps, and think about any sort of activity that they're going to do. Will it absolutely prevent an injury? No but can it stack the cards in the dog's favor? Absolutely. So important to do that. Same thing with the cool down. One of the worst things that we can do is take a dog that is so active and they're up and put them into a crate because now we have all that blood flow going. We, the dog's in danger of potential issues with overheating, muscle soreness because they haven't had a chance to properly cool down, lower their heart rate, their respiratory rate, get the blood flow going out from the periphery or the, um, the limbs and back up to the, the core area. And here, what I like to do is do a five minute faster walk, five minute slower walk, and then some specific stretching. And I always have people ask, what if I'm running multiple dogs in agility or I have this? Anything is better than nothing. So, you know, keeping that in mind and you may need to increase your warm up or cool down varying on um, the temperatures, where you are and all of that sort of stuff. So many variabilities there. This is one of my favorite activities to do before and after um, any sort of sport or, as I said, walking, hiking, front legs or forelimbs up. 
and it could be anywhere from a couple inches to a foot, depending upon the size of your dog. So asking your dog to hold this position will extend or open up the spine and also extend the hips. And you can accentuate it by having the dog look up. Anytime the dog's head looks up, we increase the weight onto the rear. And this is great. Hold for 15 seconds, repeat three times. And you could do this just about anywhere. If you're out walking, you could have the dog put its front legs up on a car, um, you know, a stoop, anything like that. Um, and as I said, it, it's great to do before and after. And this will help increase the flexibility of the lower back and the legs. Dogs that have had iliopsoas injuries, this is crucial to do as well. It will just help open up that area. A bow is also wonderful to do. This is going to help increase the shoulder extension and start to engage the spine. And the same thing, we're going to hold, if you can, for up to 15 seconds, repeat three times before and after activity. And the dog is doing this, so it is an active motion. We do not want a cold stretch, meaning stretch without kind of, without a warm up. Um, so, but these are all active movements and they're great to do as a warm up and to do as a cool down. Here are a little bit more specific stretching, and this is what we would do after the dog has been warmed up. Um, so great to do after activity, stretch the hips, stretch the, the shoulder out. When we're stretching the hips or the shoulder, we want to be as close as possible to the joint. A common mistake I see with stretching the hip is grabbing the toes or the knees. And this could put a lot of stress onto the um, knees and the hip. And if you'll notice in the picture, I'm protecting the other leg because that leg is, um, we have a lot of weight on that leg. So I'm just opposite and I'm protecting if the dog gets tired, she could just lean down and, um, lean on me. With stretching the shoulder, we want to push the shoulder forward. I like to think of my palm as an ice cream scoop, and I'm just scooping that elbow and moving forward. And um, again, a common mistake is tugging at the, um, the arm or pulling or you know, causing any sort of stress. And the spine should remain flat or symmetrical. So we shouldn't have any rotation or anything like that with, with those motions. And we're going to always look that each dog has different needs. So we have to factor in, as I mentioned earlier, just like us, so many different things when we're designing an exercise program. The Chesapeake uh, with the bird in her mouth is over 11 years old and uh, she was just at her nationals and um, did phenomenal and um, her owner was so happy that she's able to hang with all of the other dogs able to keep up her endurance and her strength and um, she competes still in agility on a uh, modified or preferred is still very involved in the field. Um, also very involved with just walking and normal activities. And she has been coming in for canine conditioning since she was a year old. So she comes in every Wednesday and works out in the underwater treadmill and does some core exercises. And then her owner definitely does a lot of things, but you know, it's always, you look at her and look how happy she looks. I mean, she is just phenomenal. So we need to factor in overall health. So how is the dog? Are there any other issues going on? For example, do they have any metabolic disorders, Cushing's, Addison's, um, any cardiac issues that we have to be aware of? Um, you know, again, just their general health, their orthopedic health. Do they have osteoarthritis and 
most dogs over the age of seven have some form of arthritis. It's an inflammation of the joint and you know, that can definitely be managed with the multimodal approach of decreasing pain and inflammation and improving their strength and function. We look at their age and this dog over here, I'll just show you, is 15 years old and had a back issue, one of many, and we're just working on his core, his balance, his proprioception, he has cataracts. And we worked on this little infinity from Toto Fit for about 10 seconds, took a break, and we repeated that. He was exhausted after about two minutes of exercise. And this was part of his multimodal approach. So much different than if he were two and we would have you know, done more. We look at the breed. So certainly different breeds are going to be different. Our, um, I remember this wonderful Mastiff that we were getting ready to go to Westminster and um, he came in and his owner said, I just want him to keep running around the ring and not lay down. And I said, that's a working dog. That's a very good goal. And the first time we got him in the underwater treadmill, he did two minutes and he slept for about two days. So um, my rule of thumb is the dog can be tired four to six hours after the activity, but not more than that. So it was definitely too much for him, but he started to every week he would improve and he got up to where he was moving for 15 minutes in the underwater treadmill, which is equivalent to a 45 minute walk outside. So he went into the breed ring at Westminster and he did never sat down. He did great. He took an award of merit owner handled, which was fantastic, but we certainly have to factor in the breed and what they can do. I mean, some of our brachiocephalic or our, um, our pugs, our bulldogs may not be as active as, let's say, a Border Collie or a Malinois or a German Shepherd. And then we definitely have to look at their fitness levels. So what are we starting with? I've had very young dogs come out of a kennel situation, and by all rights, they should be in great shape, but they've never done anything. So we have to factor that in. Then like the dog like Makai that could keep up and she is in the underwater treadmill for 30 minutes once a week and can handle hiking out in the field for two hours. So lots of things to factor in and consider when designing a fitness program. We always, always, always have to stick to this do no harm so that no pain, no gain is not going to apply. So we do not want to do anything that's going to cause harm. In New England right now, there's a ton of um, the fairs going on and so many of them have dock diving. And I haven't gone to a fair in a couple of years due to COVID, but I used to cringe at some of these overweight dogs that just have no business dock diving. And there, uh, the owners are trying to get them to move and jump into the water. And I just think, oh, this is going to be a disaster. Um, so don't do harm. You know, if it seems like it's too crazy for your dog, trust that. And as I mentioned, fatigue is normal four to six hours after exercise, but we don't want it longer than that. And we've probably all done it to ourselves where you've overdone it and you can't move the next day. And it will happen, but for the most part, we want to avoid it. And you want to try to pay attention to um, the older dogs and the puppies because older dogs can easily eagerly do too much and so may puppies. One of the things that I always suggest for owners is to take photos and write down the goals for your dog and take photos every six months and do the front, the rear, and each side. And then also keep a journal while where you put these photos of their diet, their activity, their lifestyle, and the weight. This is one of my uh, fitness trainer students. And she sent this picture of her dog who is now 11. 
And um, of the difference in what core work has done for him. So we look 2015 and his top line is not great at all there. And then look six years later, he looks much better now than he than he did. And that was all a matter of core work and strengthening and doing all of that. So, um, you know, just fantastic. So a lot, you know, great to see. And proactive steps to take. And this is always, and I'll mention this a few times, certainly weight management. And, um, you know, definitely we've, especially in the United States and now many other countries too, we're just used to seeing overweight dogs. And um, it can be devastating, even an extra pound or two. Puppy growth, and we'll talk about puppies, but we need to respect what our puppies are doing and they're not little dogs. Awareness of injuries. So if your dog is limping, they're in pain. So taking a limping dog to do any sort of activity, even a walk is not a good idea. And you as the owners, the quicker you can catch it, the less chance you have of letting it become a bigger thing. So important to take a look at that proper amount of exercise, and then realistic activities. You know, certainly taking a basset hound and wanting to do fly ball may not be the best activity for that basset hound because of the long back that the basset has. Weight management. And I see this a lot in big dogs. People tend to think, oh, they're just big. Well, this mastiff should not be 240 pounds. And that excessive weight puts a great deal of stress on the joints. So even taking it one pound of excessive weight can put in an additional four pounds of sheer force on the joints. And it just, you know, it is incredible how just taking a little bit of weight off can really make the dog more active, get them moving more Then that helps with more weight. So, um, when a dog is suffering from osteoarthritis, it is much better to be on the leaner side. And not only for musculoskeletal reasons, but for cardiac, respiratory, metabolic diseases, we know that dogs that are a proper weight live longer than overweight dogs. That's a fact. So, and sometimes it's hard to say, oh, you know, my dog is gaining weight. So I always say, have a buddy that's completely honest with you. And can say, hey, I think the dog has put some weight on um, and, um, you know, to give you a little bit of a guideline. So puppies, we'll talk about puppies first since everybody loves um, puppies and it's always fun to, to see. And I was definitely guilty of getting a pandemic puppy. Um, so my uh, Clumber Spaniel is uh, once I knew we were going into lockdown. He joined our family, um, but always, you know, who doesn't love a puppy? But puppies are not little dogs. And, you know, very, I see this, especially in the working world and the performance world, that puppies, agility dogs, uh, they're destined to be this and their training starts early, which foundation training is great. But in many, many venues, you can start competing dogs at 15 months, meaning those dogs have probably started doing activities way too soon. So we need to you know, factor that in. Puppies are not little dogs. Their nutritional needs are definitely different. You know, we have to factor that in their growth plates. And this is just looking at an average time of months in uh, um, when the growth plates start to close. And I like to think of the growth plates as like the little machines in the dog's bones that while the growth plates are open, those machines are working to make sure the bone grows the proper length and the proper strength. If those growth plates are damaged from too much jumping, too much running, the bones are not gonna grow properly. And the growth plates close all at different levels. The only way to tell is through radiographs or x-rays. So I, I always like to wait until we know 
growth plates are closed up between 18 and 24 months. For those of you that are doing prelim hips or uh, you know, looking at OFA or pen hip, it's a great time to also look at the growth plates. So always think about this, excessive jumping, excessive running, this can always damage the growth plates. And here again, just looking at the growth plates in this open area, and this area with too much jumping can fracture. There could be um, lots of issues going on here. So you know, just a little bit for you to, to look at with the bone here and um, think about this when you're exercising the puppies. And we wouldn't do this to a child. You know, there are specific rules in children's sports about how much they can do and because we know that there's been, there could be damage to the growth plates and could cut their sporting career short. To avoid growth plate damage, and this is not a hard rule, but it's a general guideline I give. So five minutes of exercise per one month of life. But I think we have to use common sense with this also. So four, min four months of age, 20 minutes of exercise. And this could be split up, 10-minute walk or, you know, some core work, that sort of stuff. But um, if the puppies are playing, that's a little bit different. You know, so they're self-moderating. Most puppies, when they're tired, they'll sleep. So it's usually us that are pushing them. But definitely no extreme jumping, no extreme running. Um, and allow a tired puppy to rest. And I know there's been um, the past couple of years information out there about, I think, comparing wild dog puppies like wolf puppies, that they're, they're always running and they're on the move, but to a point, but they're also probably resting, you know, more than we realize as well. So they're also self-regulating. So I think you have to use common sense with this. There are certain breeds that are definitely more active. Puppies are going to sleep more when they're going through a growth plate, a growth stage, not a growth plate. Um, so important to you know know about that, and um, you know just what they're doing. You know if they're busy chewing a bone, I don't consider that exercise. That's more enrichment. In the house, we want to avoid jumping off of furniture, avoid running downstairs repetitively. Um, avoid excessive time on slippery floors. You know, so puppies that are growing up on slippery floors can have a higher risk of hip and elbow dysplasia. So that excessive slipping is, is not good or beneficial. Many people love it because it's easier to clean up, but no. And this too, just another in larger breed dogs, which the growth plates are going to close slower. And if we just look, those hips may not close until they're after 18 months of age. And this is why we often look at some of these big breeds and um, they're at two years of age, two and a half years of age, they're still growing. So um, again, just keep that in mind and factor that in. Mental exercise or mental enrichment is so good. I love snuffle mats, lick -a mats and I'll start combining them with fitness activities. We'll see some videos that um, we can work with as well. And puppies should not limp. So I think this is very important when we're discussing fitness um, because I often hear, oh, you know, yeah, he's just limping a little bit, it's no big deal. Well, a limping or lameness that continues, you know, sometimes the dog stubs their toe, they limp for a few minutes and then they're done. But anything that's continuing should be a red flag. So why are they limping? Why are they lame? It, many reasons. It could be growth related, um, could have hip elbow issues. They could, you know, just be overtired, but they should not be limping. And limping equals pain. And this is big dogs, little dogs, puppies, old dogs. If a dog is limping, even though they're not crying out in pain, assume it is pain. So think about if you get up in the morning and you're a little bit stiff, 
you know, and you're kind of limping and it may not be an outward, you know, extreme pain, like when you stub your toe, but you have stiffness and some areas of discomfort. So that is always, an, again, a red flag. We never want to push a dog through a limp. So if your dog wakes up and they're limping, not good to you know, pursue the activity for the day. Let them rest. And causes of lameness in puppies, certainly growth plate concerns, hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, obesity, overweight dogs are going, you know, could limp, nutrition may be an issue, fatigue, and then structural issues. If we look at this dog, uh, she definitely has some structural issues there with her knees and, and everything else. So puppies, I see a lot of lab breeders and um, that the bigger the lab puppy, the cuter, but that is not good. Um, so a chubby puppy, you know, it's not good. There's a lot of excessive weight on their, their joints. I promise you, if that dog is meant to be 100 pounds, they will be 100 pounds, whether they get there at six months or 18 months. A slower growth is much, uh, much better. And then proper nutrition, so, so important. So work with either a veterinarian nutritionist um, to design a proper diet if you're not sure. You know, I hear just about everything. I have been, um, I've owned Wizard of Paws now for 25 years and I hear everything. Um, this puppy here actually had rickets and um, she and her brother, the litter was raised by a veterinarian that was experimenting with a new diet um, and all the malnourishment. They were both fairly weak. Um, it took us about six weeks to get them back up to, to normal. So, um, you know, there's so much information on diets and if you need help with a uh, um, nutrition program, email me, I could send you somewhere to do a virtual one. There's so many things to factor in and we know so much more about nutrition now than we did 20 years ago. And um, so lots of, of great things out there that we can do to help the dogs. Puppy exercise. So, you know, so often we want to tire a puppy out, I hear, but also, you know, provide enrichment for them. And we could do this safely. So puppies, I actually um, begin working with puppies as early as two weeks of age. So you can start to work on their balance, their proprioception. We know that by simulating low level movements, we're able to help strengthen up their hips, their elbows, um, and just begin activities. And these are discs by Toto Fit. They're phthalate free, which if you're not familiar with phthalates, you don't want your dogs, puppies, children, or you near them. So all the equipment is phthalate free. And if you use the yoga mats or anything like that, make sure they are also um, phthalate free, but just working on some gradual weight shifting. And, um, and when the puppy gets tired, they're done. And I will say this probably five more times. I'm a big believer in quality over quantity. So I'm never going to say do three sets of 10 of something. I'm more interested in doing it the right way and taking frequent breaks. Um, already said this, but worth repeating, if your puppy's limping, stop the activity and keep track of the limping. Um, when does it occur? Because all of this, I always say if a dog is limping, it's like putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So making, letting, you know, just trying to figure out when the puppy is having difficulties or any problems. So with um, puppies, like starting to um, introduce them to different activities and different surfaces between the ages of two to three weeks. And, you know, most, if you are a puppy raiser, I'm sure you have plenty of great stuff in the whelping box. 
and you can throw, you know, some, again, like phthalate free um, surfaces in there. And we start preparing the, the puppy for what obstacles they're going to assume in their regular day life. And um, just helping with that confidence, the type one musculature needed for core strength and healthy posture. So always fun to, you know, work with these um, pups and to start moving them along. And as I said, introducing them to slow surfaces, we had a litter of, uh, these were six week old, six or seven week old Great Dane puppies. And we were doing a photo shoot. So they were running around and they were all like zonked out probably after 10 minutes of, and you can see they're sleeping on everything. Um, but we, and we don't want the surfaces to be too unstable. So a little bit of instability is great, but not too much. And just again, working on balance. Can they stand on them? Can they walk over them? We want to keep sessions short. How short? Maybe a minute, maybe five minutes. They're going to tell you. And again, just make sure whatever surface that you're using is phthalate and also latex free. Here, and I can put these links into the chat box um, after when I can cut and paste, but this is just something looking at puppies and preventing hip dysplasia and adding in um, some core exercises. So this uh, puppy here that I'm working with had a lot of nutritional deficits, lots of problems, um, just standing, normal activities, and working with regular core strength. She turned around. It took her about four weeks, but got back to complete normal. So I'll post this in the chat box when we're done. Rest. Um, I'm not, I don't love um, strict crate rest um, for a lot of different reasons, but you know, definitely instituting rest as we had talked about it to make sure that puppies take a break. So whether, you know, crate rest, um, giving them just mental enrichment, that sort of stuff, but making sure they have that ability to rest, to nap, to recharge. Puppy lameness, again, not okay. Structural issues. And sometimes Again, we see pretty bizarre things, but if you're starting to look at your puppy and that things are kind of going awry or bizarre, um, you know, have it checked out. So I'll go over some things that are normal and not normal. You know, what can you look for? And certainly, you know, puppies grow at different rates. Sometimes their hind limbs are higher, their forelimbs and they go through ugly stages. And I had a bull mastiff that was um, a confirmation, just a beautiful confirmation dog. And he was ranked number one breed in all breed two years in a row. But I remember when he was about six months of age and probably about a year, he was butt ugly. I mean, his body was all over the place. And I often look back on uh, some of his pictures and couldn't believe he matured into such a lovely dog. But some things to look for with your puppy, are they excessively sleeping? So sleeping more than normal. And certainly this could be a lot of different things, but it may be something else going on. Have they stopped engaging in a certain activity? Do you have, are they difficult to, to wake up? Um, you know, are they just not acting normal? What are their postures like? And a sitting posture like this is, you know, something to worry about, not only in a puppy, but in an adult dog. So this could be, this is similar to um, a child W sitting. So it could be due to laxity or looseness in the hips, the knees, um, the hocks. It could be you know, due to hip dysplasia, it could be just to weakness. So um, I always like to know what their norm is, what they started out as, and what are they like now? You know, again, just looking at some other sitting postures, this, the yellow lab is a dog that I'm working on 
working with that has um, hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia. And she's always sat like this. And so through a lot of strengthening, she's gotten a lot of better, a lot better. The um, dog on the bottom is a lazy sit. And so, you know, do how often does your dog lazy sit? Is that normal? Are they always sitting on one side more than the other? Um, we can definitely work on things. The border collie is sitting on a wedge and we're working on postural control. So again, I'll ask you guys to check your posture. How are you sitting? Um, if we sat on an unstable surface, it would engage our abdominals and our lower back. So this can be done with dogs just sitting on an unstable surface and having them hold a tight sit. And when they start to kind of butterfly their legs out or lose it, time to take a break. And you can repeat this up to 10 times. And if you don't have a disc or a wedge at home, you can use a dog bed, a sofa cushion, um, anything like that works fantastically. As I mentioned, limping pain. So dogs demonstrate pain in different ways. And I know I've said this three or four times, but I always, I'm always amazed at owners that say, oh, like this dog came in and the owner said, it's, the dog's not in pain. Well, the dog's not putting any weight onto that forelimb. And dogs do not always cry out. They don't always verbalize. Um, they are you know, very good with their survival instincts and um, not verbalizing. But when there's pain and inflammation, it's going to lead to a decrease in strength, a decrease in function, and a loss of motion. So again, you see your dog limping, it's important to determine why. This is an example of a hind limb lameness and watch the back end and you can see this Newfoundland is off and I'll play it a couple times. Um, there's a lot of hair there. <laughs> and um, some people are excellent at picking up lamenesses, but can you see the dog dropping the hip there? And typically with a hind limb lameness, the dog may um, lower their head, dogs, put 60 to 70% of their weight on their front legs, 30 to 40 on their back legs. So it is a little bit more difficult to see a hind limb lameness, um, but you know, just watching again. Oops. And um, here, another video of a hind limb lameness. If you watch the dog's left leg, just short striding there and skipping. And he has a partial cruciate tear and um, so you can see, just off waiting that a little bit, and I'll play it again. And then with a forelimb lameness, so what we'll see is usually the dog will um, head bob. So when they strike with their forelimb, their head will come up. And um, because the dogs are putting so much weight onto the forelimb, when they hit, they'll come up pretty quickly. So um, el uh, forelimb lameness, there's so many things that could be definitely elbow dysplasia, soft tissue issue, OCD lesions, uh, damage to the nail or a paw. Whenever I see a lame dog for the first time, I look at their their paws and their nails to rule out anything there, and then growth-related illness. This multimodal approach, so again, if there's ever any pain, the goal is to reduce pain and inflammation and improve strength and function. So for those of you that may have your dog on an anti-inflammatory, or they may be on pain medication, or they may be getting lasered or massaged or chiropractic, it is crucial that they also have a strengthening program. So we are not going to get the dog back to complete normal if we don't have that strength and range of motion program or fitness program. So ask yourselves, you know, is the dog on anything? Have they been prescribed anything? Do they go for regular chiro massage, acupuncture, do you have a fitness program to go with that? Because you should. 
Um, bunny hopping. I just wanted to mention this too, because if dogs are bunny hopping um, and puppies may bunny hop, and this is literally, it looks like a bunny. The dogs will move along and um, they're moving both hind limbs at the same time. And um, it could be just some coordination issues, a sign of development, or um, there, it could be an issue with the hips, the knees, the back. And, um, you know, a lot of puppies will do this. And if this puppy goofiness does not get better, then it should definitely be checked out. Muscle loss. If you look at this picture, you could see the dog's left leg is skinnier. So this is something to always take a look at and um, pay attention to with your, with your dogs as part of the fitness programs that I do with owners. I have a measure of the dog's front legs and back legs and compare side to side. And because one of our goals is always going to be to increase the muscle girth, but um, we, all, we want to pay attention and uh, you know, see how they're doing with that. If a dog has difficulty standing, so hesitant, so there, that little bit, we can look at the dog and you see the dog is gingerly standing and not extending as well. And I always like to look at a dog's rear and dogs should have fairly large gluteal and hamstring muscles or a big butt for lack of a better term. And the hind end, even though it takes 30 to 40% of the weight, this is going to be the area that propels the dog. So walking upstairs, jumping into the car, going over jumps. And if there's weakness there, they're not going to be able to do it. One of the first signs of a problem with a senior dog, maybe not jumping in the car or not being able to go upstairs. So it's important to watch this. This dog had um, hip pain and back pain and just wasn't able to put on strength until we were able to reduce the pain and then um, started strengthening. So awareness of injuries. If um, you know your dog 99% better than anyone else, and I always tell an owner this, if you notice that anything is off, get to the root of the problem and find a professional that listens to you. So again, you know your dog. If you think something's going on, pursue it because like I said, 99% of the time owners are always right. Some signs of um, injuries in puppies, older dogs, reluctance to perform certain activities, like go up the stairs, jump into a car, walk on slippery floors. Um, I, if your dog always sleeps on the bed with you and is no longer jumping up, why? Are they not strong enough? Are they in pain? Um, what's going on? I always assume physical before behavioral. I'm talking at a conference later this month on um, pain and aggression. So I see a lot of dogs that are labeled as aggressive and they're really painful. So the pain is going to cause all of these issues. So I like to assume it's physical before behavioral. Additional signs, so difficulty getting up, scraping of nails. I always have owners listen to their dogs. Um, does the dog scrape their nails while they're walking or maybe on a land treadmill? And a little trick, if you're not so sure what's going on, especially in your older dogs, or if you're suspecting a neurological issue, is take nail polish and paint the top of the nail and the bottom of the nail. And don't look at it for two days. Then go back and the top of the nail should st <clears throat> stay well. Um, you know, all nice. And the bottom one should be uh, evenly you know, uh, worn down. If not, that adds to some pieces of the puzzle. Um, difficulty with, with turns. So, you know, sometimes people that compete in agility will say, my dog has a tough time turning right, you know, or doesn't make a great turn going right. So want to look at that and figure out why. 
reminder not to overdo it. I saw this during the pandemic and how many of us walked our dog, at least initially, so many times. So just a reminder not to overdo exercise as we start to get into the exercise. So when we look at strengthening, and there typically when the hind end is higher than the forelimbs, there's going to be more weight on the forelimbs. And like um, this guy is doing, so his rear is higher than his front legs. So there's more weight there. Some keys here, we want to keep the flat line or the top line flat or level. We also, I always look at the point of the elbow and we want those elbows always pointing straight back to the knees or like taillights in a car pointing straight back. If they start to come out, the dog is getting tired and that's a sign of a break that you'll need a break. Using unstable equipment is going to help work balance, proprioception, um, and this is going to be key in all of the dogs, no matter what we do. With resistance training and strength training, we're going to build muscle. So don't be alarmed if as you start working, you start to see um, your dog get a little bit thicker. And um, that is always important, you know, to, I always warn owners, the stronger your dog, it's going to stack the cards in their favor to protect against injury. Um, we're going to burn calories faster. This is why such active dogs burn so many more calories. It's going to increase bone density. So women that are on here over the age of 50, you know, if you've had a bone density exam, you may be told you need more weight bearing activities. It's the same with our dogs. It's going to um, improve stamina and endurance, reduce insomnia. We don't always see this in dogs, but um, we may see it in a kennel situation that the dogs, you know, are not sleeping because they're not getting enough activity. And it's going to improve conditions such as diabetes, depression, osteoarthritis, and of course, obesity. So overall general health. We have an increased blood flow to the muscle fibers. And this is why when we're performing activities, we want to get a gradual warm up. We're going to increase the availability of fuel to the muscles, increase the cell mitochondria, and this helps provide injury. Uh, energy, not injury, uh, stronger bones. It's going to uh, give us stronger connective tissues. The stronger the dog is, the less likely they're able to injure the connective tissue. Not always going to happen. We'll still see some cruciate tears and things like that. Um, and increased flexibility. And if you look at this dog, Gracie up here, notice her hind limbs are higher than her forelimbs. So we're adding more weight onto the forelimbs. And this is a great setup for dogs with shoulder issues, elbow dysplasia, or any kind of weakness in the front legs. And we can start with it being static, meaning not moving, and then we could add movements to it. Whenever a dog lowers their head, we increase the uh, amount of weight onto the forelimbs. We can have the dog turn side to side. We can have them um, catch treats. That's all going to be great for them. With resistance training, we're going to focus on the various body parts and what, you know, we're going to need. Digging is a great activity to work the forelimbs. If we think about grizzly bears, they do a lot of digging and they have that grizzly hump. So we're working the scapular muscles and it's going to work the flexors of the body. So really working on those shoulder flexors, the toe flexors. Digging you know, is fantastic. Um, you may not always want your dog digging, but I love to use it as a cross training program. And it could be digging on the beach or in a sand bucket or anything like that. Um, if for those of you that can do any kind of hurting with your dog or running on unstable surfaces, just working on uh, digging will help strengthen those toes. And uh, so the right amount of exercise is going to be crucial. 
we have to find that balance, you know, between not doing enough and too much. We want, again, all those principles we look at, you know, um, movement to, is going to be essential to a dog, especially those large breed dogs. And again, talking about quality over quantity. So walking, one of my favorite activities, and um, this is something and, you know, go, I'll say to so many owners, just go take your dog for a walk. And um, my favorite is outdoor walks. Of course, not um, everyone, depending upon where you live or your own ability, you may not be able to walk. So land treadmills work. Um, land treadmills, the thing to always keep in mind is if your dog's used to doing a 15 minute walk outside, I would only start with a seven and a half, eight minute walk on a land treadmill because they're not able to rest um, on a land treadmill. There's also a little bit of a stress component, some safety issues. You never want to leave a dog alone on a land treadmill. Um, and many land tre treadmills also allow you to uh, have an incline, which an incline will work more of the rear and a decline will work more of the front. But you know, walking your dog, if you could sneak in three 10 minute walks a day, um, many owners say they don't have time you know, before work or something like that, set your alarm 10 minutes earlier and go take your dog for a walk. It's so great for not only the dog, but for you as well. And, um, you know, if you're, everyone has smartphones now, you know, take your phone and time how far, you know, how long you walk. You know, if you have an Apple Watch or anything like that, you could, you know, just start to keep track of that. Um, you know, again, like simple walks is great are great. They're just so beneficial to, you know, assist the, the dog with all of these, um, you know, to get out and to get movement, to get moving. Uh, some other very simple exercises to, to begin. And one of the, the simplest exercises is just starting with weight shifting. And we normally, when we're standing, when we look up, and for those of you that are standing right now, you can try it, look up and you'll feel a transfer of weight onto your heels. We could do this with a dog and it is a, a great simple exercise for any dog, but especially our seniors, dogs with weak hind ends, neurological issues, puppies, body awareness, and the key will be to ask them to look up and transfer weight onto the rear without sitting down. So sometimes the hand signals, you know, you have to figure out. But um, doing this, and I like to do it with my own dogs, we do it 10 times before each meal. Um, you can do it to fatigue. Whenever you give the dog a cookie, anything like that, you can ask them to look up. And this will transfer that weight. And then we can make it more difficult. We can also work on manual weight shifting. So some dogs don't like to be touched and that's okay. We could do it other ways too. But if I wanna work on strengthening up the dog's hips, I can place my hands over the dog's hips and shift the weight back and forth. And the goal is not to push the dog over, but rather shift the weight from side to side and hold for a second. So I count one, one, go back and forth. And this you're gonna do until the dog gets tired. You can do it on their hips and you can do it on their shoulders. So, and you just wanna make sure you're not aggravating the dog and you're doing it on a good surface. We can also do front paw lifts or give paw. So when this dog is lifting its right front paw, we're increasing weight onto the left hind limb. So when we're doing this and when we lift the left front, we increase the weight on the right hind limb. So if you know your dog has a specific weakness or they've had cruciate surgery or you know, you're just trying to determine what's going on. We can lift 
and see how the dog handles it and just hold for a couple seconds or two their tolerance. So this is something that you can lift for a second and then build up to and increase your number of reps as suitable. But this is great for every, every dog. The same thing with the hind leg, lift, hind leg lifts. Because the dog is putting more weight onto the forelimbs to begin with, it may be a little bit more difficult to pick up the hind limb. When picking up the right hind limb, more weight goes onto the left forelimb. And when picking up the left hind limb, more weight goes onto the right forelimb. And we don't want to lift too high because we don't want to stress the spine. We want to keep the top line flat or level. And this is great to help strengthen up the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and also um, the dog's core. And we can use these exercises as a baseline here. Make sure there's no sound working with this little guy just to pick up um, the back left to get some more weight onto the right forelimb. So he had an injury. So picking up that left and just shifting some weight there. And you, I like owners to do this um, because it helps determine if, you know, the dog is reluctant to put more weight onto an area. So if they're starting to have some issues, let's say picking up the right hind limb, you may think something's going on with the left hind limb or the left forelimb. So it's a nice exercise to do and also a good check-in with your dog. We can then increase the intensity. So we can have the dog put their four limbs on an unstable surface, or we can have them put four limbs and hind limbs on an unstable surface. And this is going to make the exercises more difficult. Adding the head movements in or the manual weight shifts are going to further increase that. So again, we're going to do this until the dog is tired. And you could do this on a, a variety of surfaces, um, depending we'll work the forelimbs, the hind limb, and the core. When the forelimbs are elevated, we're getting some instability there at the forelimbs, but we're also getting more weight onto the hind limbs. And then we're working that core as well. With the hind limbs elevated, there's going to be more weight onto the forelimbs. And remember what I said about those elbows. We always want those elbows pointing straight backward. So We'll work that, the level top line, and then we'll challenge the core. And this is also going to work those hind limbs. So great for hip dysplasia, cruciate disease, everything like that. This is um, an, a dog with a forelimb issue, and I was trying to keep her busy. So she was snuffle matting, which I love, while on an unstable surface. And um, the stuffle mat is on top of a disc. So while she's standing there, she's doing her own head up and down because she does not like to be touched. So this was great to get her own weight shifting, keep her busy, get her head movements in there and work her core. And again, we went to tolerance here. And this is something that her owner's doing at home. So lots of fun if snuffle mats are or lick mats or something that you can definitely work on to engage the core and get more activity going. Oops, um, here we go. So when we work core exercises and standing on something unstable, um, the core is going to benefit the lower back, the abdominal area. So here's a little check-in. How's your po sitting posture right now? If you straighten up, um, it'll also work the major muscles of the hips and the shoulder. And the stronger the core, the stronger the body will be. And um, core work, as I said earlier, is very important for dogs of any age. And the thing that will change is the time and the surface. So getting that core stronger, with a senior dog, we might, may work for a few minutes. With a younger dog, we may work for 15 minutes. Um, 
but very important for all types of dogs, especially larger dogs, dogs prone to orthopedic and neurological conditions. Um, it's just going to be so beneficial. So here, just looking at the um, standing with the both forelimbs and hind limbs, and can just start with this and looking. And if you look closely, this dog doesn't have all um, his weight on that right hind limb. And um, so we're taking a look at that. You know, does your is your dog able to stand well? And we can start with just standing and increase the time and, you know, giving just the dog treats. Then we could have them start to look all over the place, up, down, side to side while maintaining that. Then we can get a little bit more dynamic and ask for a sit to stand or a down on these un unstable pieces of equipment. And so here, just looking side to side, head up, down. If your dog is good at catching treats while they're standing there, you can toss some treats too. Some of the disc dogs I work with, we work on sitting on an infinity while they're catching discs. So they're getting that dynamic core there and uh, keeping them busy. Some additional simple exercises, and I threw this little humping one in to make sure you're paying attention. Um, walking backwards, which we'll talk about. Uh, walking in figure eights is great to get warm up the spine as well as get some good spinal flexibility. Feet up on objects. So that stretching, also putting weight onto the hind end. Sit to stand. Sit to stands can be incorporated throughout the day. You could ask for three sit to stands before your dog gets into the car or before they go up a flight of stairs. Then you could challenge them by sitting on a disc and doing it or the dog bed. Um, walking uphill is a great exercise to strengthen up the dog's rear, specifically the hamstrings and the gluteals. And I always say that the hill should be um, steep enough that you feel your rear end working. And if we go up about 100 feet, turn around, zigzag back down so there's no stress on the shoulders or the iliopsoas, and repeat that. Um, you know, up to 10 times, maybe more, maybe less, just depending upon your dog. And working on... Um, the looking at the dog pushing off the proper amount on their hind end. So this balance and proprioceptive exercises, you know, again, working similar to what we're doing with the, um, the Leon burger here, the Corgi, just starting to gain some shoulder strength as well as some more weight onto the rear. And when we work on these core exercises or balance and proprioception, it takes an honest 10 to 14 days to see a difference. So this is something that I would definitely have the dog do every day. Again, to tolerance, the dog may stand up here for 10 seconds, take a break. And then I may repeat that up to 10 times. And you can do it twice a day, you know, again, looking at the fatigue factor. Walking on unstable surfaces. This is one of uh, an, a floating dock that I walk my um, dog on every day and um, helping with balance and proprioceptive exercises are so important. It helps with ligamentous issues. If your dog is prone to myelopathies, um, a lot of big dogs are um, corgis, degenerative myelopathies, anything like that. So unstable surfaces, floating docks are great. If your dog goes out on a kayak, a canoe, a boat, that simple weight shifting is fantastic um, to help with uh, strengthening. As I mentioned, walks, you know, much different than backyard play. So this was my pandemic pup walking with my older dog. And we would go for um, two 10 minute walks a day and um, just getting out there. And I have my clumbers are at two different ends of the spectrum now. My older guy is uh, receiving chemotherapy. Um, so his walks are much different now. We go around the block and we take our time. 
but it's still wonderful for his endurance and his enrichment, um, as well as the fact that he's a senior and I want to keep him moving. So just going along there and you can see the difference. <laughs> um, backwards walking or taking steps back. And I have, I don't know why I have Leo in here. Um, when um, the dogs, and I'll show you some activity, stepping backwards, this is such a great activity and we can do so much. And I apologize, I must have like nabbed this from something else. Um, walking backwards and taking some steps. And um, if we watch this video, we'll see um, the dog backing up onto different objects. So we want the hind yes. end to lead. And we also, as we go to different surfaces, we'll work on the balance and proprioception and body awareness. So these are the mats and um, they help great with toe flexion. This is a wedge we're just backing up to, and you can use a variety of things at home, but this is great for working on hind end awareness. These are to, uh, pods, smooth pods, and you can see she's really working on that. But the different surfaces <laughs> and working the strength, and you can go different distances, you can ask for a sit once the dog reaches the obstacle. So lots of different things. And this is so good to work on that body awareness and um, that strength. And this is also something you can incorporate during the, the day, just by asking that dog, you know, to walk backwards before they come in from outside, take a few steps before you give them a treat. So you can incorporate, we can set up obstacles that they'll step over. <clears throat> um, here is just another example of core workout, having the dog on unstable positions and challenging their head. You know, so head up, down, side to side. You can have them give paw. You can have do manual weight shifts. Any two pieces of equipment or even one big piece of equipment. There's a lot of different things that you can do to challenge them. Oops, let me go back there for a second. My bad. Hold on. Okay. Here we go. So we can see her tail. And um, just a, as the turning, and I always like to put harnesses on dogs so we could, you know, if they slip or anything like that, look for that nice level top line, look for how they're standing, good tail movement is great, and get that, you know, nice core work out there. And again, just going to their, you know, their ability there. Some um, other things, so working on four limbs up. So this is going to increase the weight onto the hind limbs. This boxer, she was at getting ready for the breed ring, but then also um, uh, puppies. So we wanted to strengthen her core. So just the simple weight shifting, <laughs> and she was having a good time here. And um, here, just setting up different obstacles, making it a little bit more dynamic and uh, working on climbing, so going up and really working on that rear, that balance there. We can see him working so nicely on that unstable surface. So lots of things uh, going on there. Coming through. Um, as we progress, as I mentioned, we wanna do, we wanna look at quality over quantity. So we, you know, I would much rather have a great 10 minute walk than a so-so 15 minute walk. So we always want to look for signs of fatigue. You know, is the dog standing underneath themselves? So when they start to bring their legs in tighter, they're reducing their center of gravity. So maybe they're, um, you know, they're getting tired, they're starting to stress. When we look at our seniors and a lot of what we talked about is so appropriate for them, but keep in mind a lot goes a long way. So it's crucial to work on their balance and proprioception. One thing that starts to happen with older dogs, same with people, older people is um, 
They start to lose their balance. Uh, they may fall more frequently. Their base of support starts to narrow. We want to give them frequent rests. So whenever the dog needs a rest, perfect. And think about enrichment tools. So the snuffle mats, there are some of the programs I have for senior dogs involve finding some treats in the living room or the room that they stay in. So they're engaging, they're using their mind and their body. And as I said, um, balance, so important. This is a wobble board. We're just doing some weight shifting on. You can see the dog is weak in its hind end. Um, and you know, we're going to respect that. We're also going to respect if they're painful. So I hear it a lot of times, grumpy old dogs. Well, those grumpy old dogs may be in pain and they may be frightened that they're going to slip. Um, they may be frightened that someone's going to touch them, especially in their rear, you know, in their rear legs. So very important to think about that. Having their front legs up, increasing their weight onto the rear. Some safety measures with exercise. This dog's name is Archie, and I, always, I would always pose him for these crazy postures. When we're exercising, no matter what age, we're going to make sure we're in a safe area. We're always going to look for signs of fatigue and look for signs of heat or cold. So if you're outside, make sure the dog doesn't get too hot or too cold. So make sure the flooring is good. So if you're doing exercises at home, I would avoid tile, wood floor, or anything else slippery. Use a textured floor, carpet, or matting. Um, a phthalate-free yoga mat um, is always great, you know, to have your little area. Some signs of fatigue to look out for. Some, you're, the form is going to change. And again, look at your posture as you're sitting here listening. Um, how many of you have changed your posture? Because you may be getting tired, so your form is changing. The dog may be yawning, um, sitting down, running away. Remember I mentioned those elbows. How are they looking? And what are the knees looking like? When the hind end starts to get tired, the knees and the hips may start to turn out. So keep an eye on that. Is their top line starting to sink or arch? So what, you know, what are they doing there and how are they looking? This, I, um, I get stressed sometimes if I um, see on Facebook or YouTube too many of these like flashy exercises. And I always say, stick with form over flash so sit pretty, I know, is a very popular exercise, um, in my opinion, and uh, many others. It's actually one of the more dangerous exercises. Um, a dog that has the proper form and control may be able to do it okay. But this is not a beginner exercise. And I know the AKC has it in their tricks um, class and certification, but it's a very difficult exercise to do. And on the same thing with handstands that are extreme where the dog puts the hind end, you know, their back legs on a wall and, um, the dog may not be able to do this. And I always say, just because you see it on the internet does not mean your dog can do it. Like you and I could watch, you know, the Cirque du Soleil performance, performers do all of these activities, but that doesn't always mean we could do it. I mean, there's no way that I could do those exercises. Um, the same thing with watching a professional athlete do stuff. So just because you see another dog do it doesn't mean yours can do it. And keep that in mind. Um, always stay at your dog's own pace. Some, these are just some examples of other core strength here, working with, uh, you know, trampoline, um, four limbs up on Nubby Infinity, working on some weight shifting here, just giving you some different ideas. Um, endurance exercises, as I mentioned, walking, hiking, walking up a steep hill is fantastic. Underwater treadmill, if you have access to one, they're fantastic. Um, typically, uh, walking in the underwater treadmill 
it's if 10 minutes is equivalent to about a 30 minute exercise outside and swimming also is a great endurance activity. Um, a couple of things with swimming is not every dog can swim. We want to make sure that um, the dog doesn't have any kind of iliopsoas injury or um, a shoulder injury. Swimming will accentu accentuate the flexion of the body, um, where walking is will accentuate more of the extensors. So when looking at swimming, if your dog is prone to iliopsoas injuries, bicipital tenosynovitis, or something similar, it'll be important to make sure your dog is completely healed and you're doing that the front leg up exercise before and after they're, they're swimming. So swimming is definitely not the be all and end all of, um, of activities. It certainly is a great endurance activity. Also be careful how they enter the water. Um, it's, you know, a strenuous activity and, um, this should say swimming. Um, and you'll be surprised how quickly the dogs fatigue. So take it slow with that. And then um, just to end with sports specific activities. And this is, this lab is involved in, um, in uh, field trials. And we were trying to mimic this going after a mark or a bird and slowing down. So this was one of his higher end exercises and we were focusing on his eccentric activity or that slowing down motion. And um, as you watch and it starts off in regular motion, then we go to slow motion and we really see how much, pay attention to his legs and his core. So we're really targeting that iliopsoas area, but watch the muscles contract. And this dog could run in the field for hours. Um, those of you that play ball with your dog or play fetch, if you don't have the proper strength or the warm up, probably one of the biggest reasons, in my opinion, dogs get hurt is playing fetch or ball. And I always say think before throwing. Um, I have a blog on that. If you're interested, I could uh, put that up as well. So we're going to mimic the activity the dog needs to perform. This eccentric involved with core is so important for our high level dogs that are slowing down or working on unstable surfaces. And again, he's a, a very fit dog and we can see how nicely his muscles are working. This is um, using a bungee cord to get a little bit, we'll see a video too, to get a little bit more endurance, a little bit more power as well, have a harness and a regular bungee cord on the dog. And here just using it in a dog sitting on a disc and I'm resisting the dog. This is one of the police dogs we work with. So we're adding a little bit more resistance to his activity. Here we're having this dog, another um, police dog just go over activities while on a bungee cord and uh, working with this. And here you could see mm -hmm. having her just move forward and move and we're working up and over on a mat. I'll play that again. And so mm -hmm. we're adding some resistance here as she moves and goes. So um, on the, the phthalate free yoga mat and working a little bit more, you know, to add some more uh, dynamic to a strengthening program. And here, just a different setup. This is my dog with hip dysplasia and we're just doing a little bit more uh, working with a bungee to help strengthen up his hips. The working dog. So certainly we think about all their endurance and everything that they need, but we need a lot of core. So this is uh, the Connecticut state police and the dogs are involved in an endurance program, but also core work and um, to help strengthen their spine, strengthen their body, lots of body awareness. 
So with the discs, we have them step over, walk on, do all these sorts of things and search and rescue, mimicking that activity, so important. Here, just another uh, video of a dog working. You see the disc on top of a trampoline and the forelimbs up. And we're looking for a nice level top line. Peanut butter on a plate works great to um, keep the dog occupied and busy. So, and we see that the shoulders and the activity there as well. And this is an 85 <coughs> centimeter infinity, <coughs> excuse me, which is great to, to work on. And then getting down. Okay, so lots of fun things to do. <coughs> My T-Rex walking here. So guidelines for exercise two. Keep in mind with, we may think we're not doing enough, but three to four minutes or five minutes may go by really quickly. So I always say a little is a lot and respect the fatigue and you can do whatever you want <coughs> three to 10 times. You know, that's sometimes people will ask how many reps, what do I do? Again, looking at that quality over quantity. And then definitely, you know, you can do it as often as you can, but two to three times a week is great to start an exercise program. You don't want to burn yourself out or the dog. Um, simple work you can do every day, you know, kind of incorporate that in. And the end results, you know, you definitely have a well-moving, beautiful dog. And I'll finish with this, this, um, was Emily and um, with her owner and handler. And so Emily was, I think the, was, I'm not still, I'm not sure if she still is, the most winningest Irish setter bitch in history. And um, absolutely beautiful dog. And she had just incredible movement and, um, we kept her going with fitness and, and all of that sort of stuff to keep her in good shape. And then she retired. She had a litter of 15 puppies. And then Adam um, had come to me probably two months after she had the puppies and said, hey, Deb, the, um, the judge at the garden or at Westminster is really good for her. Do you think we can get her in shape? to get her back out there. And her body was just a mess after having all these puppies and all of that sort of stuff. And we had, I think, six weeks to do it. So I was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. Like, she's going to stay with me Monday through Friday. And her coat is such a big deal. So he had to bathe her regularly. Um, and she wound up not only winning the, the breed, but she won the sporting group and went to best in show. She did not win best in show, but winning the sporting group was pretty good. And then I said, okay, now we're done. Well, nine months later, he came back and said, I'd love her to go to the Irish Setter Nationals. And she wound up winning for a second time at the Irish Setter Nationals as a veteran. So pretty incredible. And, um, you know, and that was, of course, like she's a pet and great quality of life, but you look at, you know, everyone's dog has a different quality of life. And this is always our goal, you know, the best quality of life for the longest time possible. And um, this is, if you need to reach me, get a hold of me, this is my email my Instagram. I'm always posting things up there for fitness as well as rehab. So if you're on Instagram, you can definitely follow and, you know, see the different things. I try to put up a couple times a day on, or I'm sorry, a couple times a week on fitness tidbits, if not more, and you can kind of see what's going on in, uh, in the life there. Um, but I will look at the chat box now and answer your questions. And certainly if you have other questions, you know, please um, 
you know, feel free to put them in and I'll go through them. And um, so Erica, um, I have a Basset Shepherd mix, looks like a GSD in a Basset body. So I'm sure that's very cute. Um, according to his vet, his front legs are more pronounced with regard to the bell, bow leg of the Basset. So definitely um, a Basset hound is equivalent to a human dwarf. So you have that chondrodystrophic issues. He's always dragged his front feet when walking, and now he's worn three nails down past the quick, causing him to intermittently limp. limp. The vet wants no walks for three days plus Rimadil. He's also on meds for hypothyroidism and is overweight. I know exercise would definitely help. What exercises should I be looking for? So, Erica, I would definitely... Um, you know, the limping. So the Rimadil should help greatly with that. You can also target it a little bit more if we know, um, you know, what to do. There are things like uh, an Assisi loop you can do at home that would help if, if the shoulders, the elbows, because we want to reduce that pain or inflammation. Um, I would definitely start with some of those balance exercises, like maybe on the ground or an unstable surface, um, they would uh, work well. And um, you know, if he's on um, good supplements, I don't know if he's on a good joint protectant, but if um, you go, I'll put my email, uh, my website here, wizardofpause.net, and you look at the store, there are the supplements that I would recommend the dosequin with the eggshell membrane to start with, and then also pay attention to the ACC loop if we can reduce his pain there. So hope that helps. Um, Susan, regarding the health condition considerations, Pixel has Addison's disease. How does that affect condition conditioning? It's not, it's well controlled and she's active in a lot of sports. So the big thing with Addison's is making sure it is um, well controlled. So that helps significantly. Mm -hmm. Then also just um, watching Pixel's core strength, because sometimes it can reduce the ability to um, reduce um, core strength. But that big step that it's well controlled, you have her on a good diet is perfect. So fantastic. Um, someone wants to know if dogs can eat grass. So if they eat grass outside, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons, you know, they could be trying, some people say it's because they're making themselves get sick or they're trying to digest things, but, you know, as long as they're not eating too much, that would be fine. Um, Jean, I have two rescue beagles, good for you, that I adopted together about four years ago. They were found together and very attached. After a year with me, a jealousy bully condition situation began. It's very difficult watching the bully dog who fears the bullies in certain situations. There's a lot of info to share writing it, not sure what to do. So I would definitely, as um, Kathy had said, like look at talking to a, um, a trainer, a behaviorist, and um, you know, working with that. I think that would be your first step, making sure that they're getting enough physical activity uh, as well, but definitely work with a, a trainer and the multi, you know, pet household, the resource guarding, all of that sort of stuff. So, and um, your dog's friend has a ton of fantastic information out there, which is, is great. Um, <laughs> Leslie, my dog loves to sniff, sniff, sniff. Do sniffy walks count as good exercises or should I keep her moving? So I think it's important for a dog to um, sniff. Um, it, but as uh, Deborah posted, it is a great mental stimulation. And I know with my guys, I mean, I do let them sniff and do what they want to do. And, um, you know, and I find we don't spend the whole walk sniffing, but I definitely give them ample opportunity. And, you know, especially if we're out hiking and I have the ability to do off leash, they could sniff a little bit and they catch up ahead. So I think it is great um, mental stimulation and enrichment. 
And as um, Deborah pointed out, there's a great article there. Oh, and Deborah, if you're hearing, yes, the snoring, that's my dog and he's still snoring away. Um, and great. So Deborah has the, in the facility, the snuffle mat, and they are just fantastic. They're wonderful. I have them around my house, not only for some, if the dogs are bored, but also to work with some activities. Allison, oh, you're so sweet. So thank you, Allison. I can attest to the results of these exercises. Dr. Taraka and Angel greatly improved my quality of life and mobility for my senior dog, Marcus, who had lumbosacral syndrome. And um, I did help set up a low impact program for him. And he did always love his PT, Allison. I definitely miss the, the videos. Um, and I will, so I'm going to also, um, send, if you go to totofit.com and look at the blogs there, there's one called think before throwing. And, um, there are also a bunch of different blogs on, um, different sort of exercises and some challenges there also. And, um, so right now, actually, there's an online um, canine fitness workshop. It's canine conditioning too, but it's definitely appropriate for anyone to join in. And that's on a Fenzy, Fenzy Dog Sports Academy. And the class just started um, October 1st. So you'd want to register for canine conditioning too. And if you go to the site, um, there's a bunch of different uh, um, uh, um, options. So I'm sorry, gold, silver, bronze, and um, that sort of stuff. So they're wonderful. And there's also a canine fitness trainer series. That's a series of four six-week classes for those of you that are more interested in learning about fitness. And like I said at the beginning, I kind of just touched upon so much. So um, definitely check that out. What kind of flooring do you recommend for working on these activities indoors? I was considering natural rubber tires to ensure non-slip cushioning. And Tracy, that would be great. So something that has some cushion to it um, and that you're not slipping on. So, um, and phthalate free. So, you know, something like I prefer about an, uh, three quarters of an inch to an inch of thickness. Um, of course, the thicker you get, the more expensive, but definitely well worth it. Mary, thank you, Mary, for being here. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Deborah. Um, thank you, Nadette, on the um, lazy sit. So definitely something, you know, can work on and, you know, take a look at that. And that's something easy. Uh, Beth, it's great to get to working and great. So I think if anyone, any other questions there, thank you so much for joining me. Again, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, again, follow me at Instagram, anything and, uh, um, you know, contact me with any specific questions. And even if they're rehab and I can help at all, there's information again on my website. And thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much, Deb. We're getting all sorts of thanks and valuable workshops and info I haven't heard before. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, so um, hopefully we'll see you again sometime. Yes. I think you've made a lot of converts. Do you teach at Fenzy Academy or? I do. So I am a regular instructor on Fenzy. Okay. So they can also look for you there. Correct. It's online um, work that they can do with their dogs. Correct. So everything is online um, there, depending upon what level dictates how much feedback you get in video. And I also um, do online consults, so virtual consults as well. Those became popular during the pandemic and are just staying popular, which I'm glad to help so many people all over. Mm hmm. Yeah, the workshops became webinars or else you wouldn't be reaching 
Yes, exactly. People, and we wouldn't have you as a speaker. So, yeah, some good things came out of it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. And um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.